now um, just for investing, just since you know the core audience that you have here is real estate investment. Um, from from what I've seen as far as uh, COVID-19 and everything, um, my investing strategies have not really changed. So I, I buy long-term properties that I hold. Um, I also flip properties and also do Airbnb. Um, the one thing on my strategy that has changed actually is Airbnb. So um, because of COVID, obviously we're not having as much travel, tourism, because airlines and all those things are shut down. So uh, Airbnb properties, I'm not really looking for those right now, just because that market is probably not going to open up for a while. Um, obviously, it's dependent on, Airbnb is very dependent on uh, where you live, you know. Um, like I, one of my partners, he lives in Orlando. Uh, he, he has about 10 or 11 Airbnbs down there. Disney World's opening back up, so it's all dependent on your market. And since we're here in Olympia, different type of market, so... Airbnb is not something that I'm focusing on. But as far as investment properties and, and flips, still very much focusing on those every single day, um, just because our market from what um, happened with COVID-19 is, uh, we've seen inventory even contract further because a lot of people going to list the market before this hit they haven't listed their homes yet. So we're seeing inventory continue to contract. So for people like myself and like yourself that are investors um, that might want to get into flipping properties, now is a really good time because you're creating that inventory. You know, um, obviously it's price point spe specific. So not all price points are the same. Um, as far as price point here in Thurston County, I like to be somewhere uh, between 250 to, to about 450. That's kind of the sweet spot in our market. So, uh, you know, we're buying all types of different properties to flip in those price points from manufactured homes to um, stick built homes. Um, so, that's it's kind of a little bit on my investing side. Nice. You know, I didn't even actually think about that when I don't look at it from that perspective always of like adding to the inventory and helping, helping increase inventory levels. But oh, yeah. that's, that's a good perspective. Um, you know, one thing you said about Airbnb, um, I, I'm friends with some other people that do that in a lot of different markets. And one thing that uh, one, one gal I know in particular is seeing now, they had, she had the lull that everybody had mm -hmm. when there's no travel, everything going on. But she has seen a huge, huge spike now in her Airbnb because, um, because of everything going on, people are avoiding hotels she, she's finding, or that's what she's at mm -hmm. least seeing in her markets. And, you know, so where I am trying to be opportunistic and I'm thinking about markets like Orlando and stuff like that, where I know there's a lot of people that are over leveraged and maybe, maybe didn't have the reserves to, to withstand this in very heavy Airbnb markets. Um, but, but with, with what she's saying, I'm like, okay, because I, I was looking at only, only, only properties that might cash flow in a long-term rental, but maybe it's an Airbnb market when things kind of turn around. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know that that sort of angle it, it opens up some different some different ideas with with the knowing that the things are picking up in that market so i don't know are you just are you just hitting time out or are you kind of waiting for certain certain things to shift um you know i'm really waiting for things to kind of kind of just open back up fully for for our market here um obviously yeah if you if you're looking in other markets it's it's still a good time especially orlando i mean Disney World pulls in people from, you know, all over the U.S. and internationally. So that market's very strong down there. And for some of you guys that don't know, the, the Orlando market's still very affordable. You can get into properties down there still for mid-200s. You know, that's actually a decent property, which is something hard for us to find up here. So, um, so no, I'm not, I'm not totally um, just turning that off. I'm just basically putting a pause on it. But... Um, when Airbnb and everything is going, I mean, it's it's like having rental properties on steroids. Mm -hmm. You know, you can usually get two to three times the amount of um, cash flow coming in that, that you would have on your your normal you know lease you know of your rental property. So that's what I really liked about it. You're you're able to leverage that property you know a lot better, and so um, you know having a cash flow of 
thousand dollars a month is is pretty normal on a on a good Airbnb. So I think it's a model that will come back around because um, for some of you guys that are interested in Airbnb, there's a site and it kind of uh, you could kind of compare it to like our local uh, multiple listing service uh, where it basically pulls in all the data for Airbnb nationally. It's called um, AirDNA, AirDNA airdna.co so if you go on that site um, you'll be able to see um, basically the best profile of property for every single market that you're interested in and so it will tell you guys um, the vacancy rates the what what it's getting on average for for rent and also the the year-over-year -year growth of airbnb in that market like here in olympia um, the airbnb market is growing about 25 percent um, annually. So, I mean, it, we have a pretty strong market for growth um, and demand. So that's why I was kind of focusing here locally, but we'll see what happens within the next, you know, six, six to 12 months, because I mean, with COVID-19, I mean, we really don't know if there's going to be a second wave. Yeah, totally. Um, so, so you have your, your investment business. How many, how many flips annually are you averaging right now? You know, an annually on, on the flips, I want to say last year, I think we, we did four, four flips last, last year. I think this year, um, you know, we would probably average about that many flips as well because of what happened. We were really trying to leverage that up. But just with COVID-19, we really lost pretty much like a quarter. So we're, we're getting ready to have one go live uh, next Monday down in Rochester that we bought for – 160,000, so it's like a little manufactured home on a half acre lot down there that we're gonna be uh, listing, I think, for 315 all year model and everything. Okay, and so, and so you, I mean, a lot of people uh, missed, I, I had a really good intro, it was really smooth, and you know, really talked you up a lot, but there's a, you have to hit record twice to make it work, and so none of that actually um, <laughs> showed up on here. Um, so as far as your real estate, your, your agent side of things goes, I know you're, um, you're, you're now an icon agent, I think for the second time with the, yep. which that's, I'll let you explain that to them and what that means. Um, but it basically means he's a big deal. And <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's something any, anybody can hit as long, as long as they're focused. Um, so, so icon agent is, it's just a, it's a, it's a ward for production at our company. So like before I was with EXP, I was with Keller Williams. And so most of the, these larger companies, we have an annual cap. So the cap is what you contribute um, to that company a year uh, for working at that company. So like the cap at Keller Williams with the franchise fee was $25,000. So at EXP, it's only 16,000. But what this is part of the reason that I was attracted to EXP was this ICON program. Um, so basically, if you cap, which in our market is about eight deals, um, uh oh, Joe's cutting out. Is it looks like you're still moving, Ash? Are you still connected? Oh, we we lost you there for a minute, Joe. You were saying you caps about eight deals. Yeah, caps about eight deals, and. So so um, then you have to do 20 more transactions after you cap. Um, and then what happens is the company gives you your full cap back in stock. So um, EXP currently is the only company that does something like this for, for awarding their agents because all the other agent or all the other brokerages are franchises. So what that means is they're not publicly traded. So that you're not able to gain any equity in that company unless you're one of the franchise owners. So, um, you know, I just did the math. I mean, I'm 38 years old. I am going to be, you know, in real estate easily for another 10 or 20 years. If I stayed at my old brokerage 10 years from now, I'm paying them, you know, $250,000 just to do business there. Um, we're at EXP, you know, I will retain, you know, in 10 years from now, $160,000 in stock and you know, is going to be worth considerably more in 10 years than it is today. So that's the icon program. So, I mean, if there's any agents out there that 
are doing, you know, about 30 deals or more a year. It's something that you should truly look at, even if you love your company, because if you're planning on being in this business for the next 10 or 20 years, you know, you need to look at how much money you're really leaving on the table, you know? So, and it's a, it's an easy way to generate wealth. I know that's a, that's pretty much a big reason why I came over it was not necessarily the, the icon program, but it was, um, kind of more the passive, the passive approach with it. Um, yeah. you know, I, I, uh, I don't know if I'll ever focus as much as hard on the retail side as, you know, to be able to hit that, but you seem to make it seem achievable with your explanation. <laughs> it, it, it is pretty achievable. I mean, I mean, for the most, most part, I mean, if agents just, uh, you know, if you're just on the phones, make, making the calls and creating new relationships. I mean, the rest, the rest will all happen. I mean, the average agent in our industry does about six to eight deals a year. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, most agents are going to count. Um, it's just really putting the systems in place. So, you know, getting a database and then nurturing that database. So you can, you know, have business from now to until the end of the year. But um, most agents, in our business, unfortunately, they just think about the next day and they're just like, how can I get a deal today? When you really need to be thinking about like the next three quarters in your business. Okay. So you have, you have the, the investment side, you got a little bit of Airbnb, you've got your agent business from transactional stuff, and then you get, you get that icon stuff back. Um, and then you have also, you have the, you have the passive income side with, with the XP as well, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a that's another big big thing that I would say EXP really um, gives us agents um, incentive to actually uh, partake in the revenue of the company. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you bring in a producing agent, um, you will get paid on their production, not from the agent split, but from EXP split. So the way I like to put that is, it's basically like a little mini referral fee where it's basically about three and a half percent of the gross. Say, you know, it was a $10,000 closing. Um, anytime they close a deal, you're going to get a $350 check from EXP um, monthly when they close a deal in that month, deposited to your bank account as a thank you for introducing them to the company. Um, the main reason the company can do this is because we're a cloud-based company meaning that we do not spend money on brick and mortar offices. We do not spend money on telephones. We do not spend money in desks. We do not spend money um, in all these places. So EXP really took a page out of the, the books of um, Amazon, or if you're familiar with Netflix, or if you're familiar with Uber, because that's where all the big tech companies are really going now is it's all going cloud-based because you have such low overhead, you can do things like share the revenue with the other agents in the company that are helping build the company. And the crazy thing is, um, you know, I've been here for two years now and um, it hasn't been that long and you can build your revenue share pretty quickly if you're just, you know, introducing the model to, to agents. But again, they have to be producing agents. That's what some people don't understand is, um, this model is really only meant for producing agents. So you can't just go out there and get, you know, 50 agents and sign them up and be like, Oh, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get all this money because they have to close the transaction at least every six months to be eligible um, in your, in your group of agents that you brought to EXP so you can receive revenue share. So that's kind of um, one thing that I think a lot of agents should understand is, um, it doesn't work if you just get a whole bunch of agents that actually have to be producing agents. Yeah, I found that out too. I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and so one thing you said too, just to make sure the people that maybe aren't familiar, you said something about the, the company split versus the agent split. And what, what he's talking about there is um, it's a EXP for that $16,000 cap. It's an 80-20 split until you pay in the $16,000. Um, and then, you know, for the other companies, like he was talking about with, I think it was Keller Williams, it's 25,000. And I think it's less than 80% is what they are actually, or less than the 20% they're contributing. So it's a little bit better cut is my, my point with that. And also to kind of explain it for some of the people that don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's definitely a better, um, it's definitely a better commission. 
uh, split that most companies start off at. And then also um, most companies have what's called a franchise fee. And so that's just for you using, you know, the franchise's name, which at some companies, um, which will blow your mind at some companies, it's 5% in perpetuity, which means there's no cap to it. So you're paying 5% total every single year on every transaction. Yeah. And that's, and that's just one, you know, I wanted, I wanted to maybe go into that a little bit with, you know, kind of explaining the different models with that side of things. Now you also have, uh, you told me you started a, a retail, an online retailer thing as well recently, I think as far as another income source. Yeah. Yeah. Just recently, um, uh, I got into, to Amazon. So Amazon is, you know, it's a big marketplace. And so that's, that's something else. I'm always looking at adding on something if it makes sense where it doesn't take a ton of my time away. And so that business is all, all online. Um, and uh, we basically sell brand name products. And the way that I set that up is um, I basically have somebody else that's uh, running that business for me. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty passive. Um, the business is pretty lucrative where you can make monthly on your, on your money that you invest 20 to 50%. Um, but it is something that you have to scale. So it's something that you can't um, really do if you don't have um, cash or, you know, lines of credit. But um, I think everybody should, should really look at after, you know, we've all been through COVID-19 as some type of online source of income. You know, because if there's another, if there's another lockdown or something like that, I think most people want to have some type of peace of mind of, having some type of income coming in, even if they have to be at home. Um, the other great thing about that business is you can do it from anywhere in the world. So you only need internet connection and a phone. Um, we don't touch any of the inventory or anything. Amazon handles all of that. So, I mean, it's a, it's, it's only going to be a growing market. I know here in the U S it's about 500 billion annually in our market. Um, and Amazon is the United States, Canada, and Mexico. So those are all the places that we sell to. So, um, so, good point. It's a multi <laughs> so um, it's, it's just something that I would definitely um, urge people to look into and, and learn it. I mean, that's the one gift that I can say COVID-19 gave all of us is that it gave us some time. So you have that time. I mean, you should really put it to, to use and learn a business model. So walk me through, so here's your, you have someone running it, but you're buying inventory. Where are you putting this inventory that you're buying? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So the inventory, um, it goes and it's shipped to one of Amazon's fulfillment centers. So Amazon basically does all the customer service for us. They do all the shippings. They handle all the returns. So anytime that you're buying a product on Amazon Prime, um, there's a good chance that it's going to be from a seller like myself. You just don't know that because it's going through Amazon's platform, but we're the ones that are providing that inventory. And there's, there's so many products on Amazon. So there's so many little niches, you know, that you can become very profitable in just a few niches. If you find a very good product that sells a lot of volume. Yeah. What do you, I mean, are you, can you share like what, what things you might've picked or what things you went into? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, like, our first, our first item that we just launched was a, was a cake pan, right? It's, it's, a, it's a household good item. Um, a lot of people are home right now. A lot of people are um, The good thing with Amazon is that you're able to look at all their data. So um, you can pick um, a winner pretty, pretty accurately because we're not just blindly picking products. We're actually looking at the last um, two to three years of what this product performance was how many annual sales it's done, how many monthly sales, what's the variation in price and all of these things. And then also see what's the competition that's selling that product. So we only go into products that um, only have like one, one or two other people that are selling that product because the way Amazon does it is they actually um, rotate or they actually split the sales between whoever, um, whoever's selling that product who's on the Amazon prime side. So that product, we ordered it for a test run because we test every product and that product we ordered it and I think in three or four days we 
sold out of that product. So we've already had to order like a thousand more, but just on that one product, um, the net profit on it's like $4,500. So if you find these good products and let's say you have 20 of them, you can see how it can be very lucrative very quickly. But again, it takes cash because you got to buy the inventory, right? We haven't been paid from Amazon yet for our initial sales. That's deposit every two weeks. So we're already having to resupply. And this time we bought, I think, like a thousand units because, you know, we didn't have enough inventory for, for the current demand. Okay. And so what, how does it work with Amazon when people return stuff? When they return stuff, um, it, it goes directly through Amazon. Um, they charge us a small fee, basically like a restocking fee. Um, and they put that back in our inventory. And then once it's in our inventory, it's just relisted on the Amazon site. So somebody can purchase it again. And then same thing, they, they, they deal with that. Then also when somebody purchases it again, they also deal with the shipping of that product and everything else. That's awesome. And what do you, and I'm assuming the person you hired is not in the U S no. <laughs> okay. What, what country are they in? Uh, so, so he's in the Philippines. So, so there, so there is a time difference. Uh, we usually talk two times a day, like once in the morning and once in the evening, evening time. Uh, so there's ways to manage like the workflow and stuff like that. Um, but uh, really leveraging uh, somebody else is, is the way to go if you're looking for a more passive business. And what do you, what do you pay your guy in the Philippines? My guy in the Philippines, we pay him like a thousand dollars a month. Okay, that's pretty good for there. That's pretty solid. It, yeah, he has, I mean, he has five year history in, in Amazon. So, I mean, he's been building Amazon stores for a long time. So um, I'll pay somebody what they're worth if, if um, you know, if everything checks out. And so like, I mean, that was even a process, right? We, we interviewed like 20 or I went through about 20 applications before, you know, I found somebody that actually had the talent. You said we, who, who was in with the, on this with you? Uh, Brandon Stevens. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. The basketball buddy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah he, he has like an anger management problem when he plays basketball. I don't know what it is. But... Brandon does? <laughs> yeah, he's like really mellow. And then he like, he gets angry. Um, <laughs> um, so, so, okay. So we got, we went through, we went through the Amazon. We went through the, the flipping stuff, the real estate business, the passive stuff of the XP. What, what else is there? I know you probably have like three or four more. We went through Airbnb. That's five. Am I still there, or, yeah. or did I freeze again? Uh oh. I think we're at five five sources right now. What? Yeah, you, you got probably have three more. Cubby Cubby hold somewhere. No, I mean I have I have my regular investments, right, like mutual funds and stuff like that. But I mean, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, real estate's still still my main my main business. It's still what I focus on day in day out, but. You know, I'm always looking for other streams and also sharing those streams uh, with with everybody else. Like one of my uh, one of my good buddies, Kevin uh, Johnson, just just stopped by my office and uh, you know I was telling him about Airbnb probably how long ago, Kevin? Like probably like a year ago or something. Yeah, and he's a contractor and so uh, he owns multiple properties in the Yellow area and so uh, he put up his first Airbnb. He built it, just a little tiny home and. Uh, that thing's being booked out every night, yeah? I, I think we were at seven nights vacancy last month. Yeah. And, and so far about maybe between two units, uh, another seven months or seven or eight nights vacancy in this coming month. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, I mean, the thing is, I mean, there's so many ways that we can all um, diversify our income streams. But I mean, at the end of the day, all of this comes down to is execution. And you and I know, Ryan, that most people, we can tell them all these things, but you know, the execution of it, it you know, that's, that's really where the secret sauce is. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know for me, like sometimes I struggle with the, uh, like I'll get everything kind of teed up, I'll get the offer sent out, but then it's like, okay, I've got all this other stuff I'm working on. And I just am like, rather than following up and like call them, Hey, you got the offer. You're looking at it. Are you going through it? Like, you know, for like an off market deal or something like that, yeah. you know, I'm always finding something else to do rather than like make another call, make another call to the same person again and again. I'm like, once the offer is sent, I'm like, okay, cool. It's done. But then mm -hmm. it bites, it bites me in the butt because I'm not like staying top of mind or now I give it more time for another investor to step in or 
like the one I was just telling you about. I got, I, I lost the deal by five grand today. And I was like, God damn it. Like, you know, and, and I come to find out the, the lender I was going to use changed from three points with the COVID stuff. They raised their, they raised the rate and they raised their points. Yeah. And they just lowered it again, back down to kind of what it was. And so like now all of a sudden my calculations, I've got more room in the deal and I'm trying to like put the guy back together. And I'm like, well, you said you got a better offer, but like, have you signed? You know, I'm just trying to like find out. And you know, he's like, he finally tells me, yeah, I signed. Damn it. You know, but just stupid stuff like that, man. And just like, what did I do? You know, trying to fix it. Cause there's those little ones that fall through. Yeah. I mean, but we all take it as, as lessons learned. Or, yeah. I mean, that's how I try to take those things. I mean, I got burned. Uh, I got burned like a, a, what is that? Probably two or three weeks ago for like three grand. It was a good deal. We were gonna, uh, you know, we we were gonna get it, you know, under market for a couple hundred thousand dollars. But I let the contract lapse, right? right? So I let it lapse, and uh, they needed some money to move out for rent, right? And so they said they agreed to the terms and everything, and uh, we gave them the money, and oh. uh, and uh, you know we went to get the contract renewed and everything, and you know they, they didn't want to do it anymore. So I mean, I, I mean everything's uh, everything in life, dude, is you know lessons learned. Uh, that's that's just kind of the way I take it. I mean, you yeah. know sometimes sometimes uh, you know you got to take your lumps and keep it moving. So this, so did they, did another investor come in or now that they moved, they're just like, eh, you know, we're not going to do it. No, I think, I think they actually put that property on the market with okay. somebody or something, but you know, I mean, my mentality is like once, once I'm done with something, I really don't even think about it anymore. Yeah. To be honest with you, I just, I just move on. Yeah. So. That's good stuff. And I don't know if Ash, Matt, you guys have any, uh, any questions or anything you want to, you want to bring up for. Yeah. I, I, I do, and I apologize. I'm like I said, I'm really new to investing in real estate. Um, so these may sound like particularly naive questions. So um, that out in front, I just want to like for for Olympia, just about the Airbnb. Why do people stay in Olympia for an Airbnb? I mean, what are the the attractions here that people are visiting? Is it just family and friends, or are they here? What's the attractions nearby that? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. So, so really for Airbnb, I mean, it's, it's multiple different reasons, family, friends, um, um, a lot of people in this area, um, host exchange students. So that's something that we've seen. Also, um, you have colleges in this area. So we have St. Martin's, we have Evergreen College. Um, and then also Olympia is like a, is like a halfway through point, basically kind of between Seattle and Portland. So we have a lot of people that travel, um, that travel, you know, through this area uh, where they're heading to Seattle or they're heading to Portland. So um, we've even seen things like uh, bands that are doing like a, a tour or some something like that, where you know they're doing they're doing basically a, a West Coast Weddings, tour or something. Children. So those are just some of the reasons why Airbnb is is popular. So other things I would say. Um, where there's like a three three day weekend and there's a softball tournament down here at the rack. We've seen that. So just multiple different um, reasons. And also, if you um, have a family like I do, a young family, um, we prefer to stay in Airbnbs wherever we go than staying in a hotel because typically we're going to have more room. And when you have kids that are my kids are two and four and they have tons of energy, we want to be in a larger space if possible. So uh, it, it's also a preference thing for some people. I'd almost say like anywhere that there's a hotel, there's a market for Airbnb. Like, and so, if, you know, otherwise, like, why are there hotels here, right? Because, you know, you, you, your first thought is look at like the huge tourist attractions, you know, like Disney World or whatever. But I remember that like any, any decent sized metro has hotels and they get people to stay there. And the reason is, could be, could be, a ton of different reasons, right? And that's that's the way, just like Joe said, personal preference, you know, we're the same way. I'd rather stay in Airbnb because of my family and stuff too. Um, well, I mean, yeah, thanks, uh, no, that's really helpful. I, I learned a lot just in that alone. The other question I had is, I mean, you know, we've been looking at my wife and I, um, who was a real estate at Keller Williams, now she's since retired. Um, she, uh, she, we've been talking about 
maybe doing starting investing in real estate and doing rentals and things, but then looking at the local market, and again, I'm new to this, so, and I know you have to find the killer deal in order to make that work, but I'm just looking at the prices here, and I don't see how you can buy a house um, and, and afford to put out a rent that anyone could afford here, you know, to make a good cash flow. I mean, I guess, are you just looking at a, at a really um, broken down places that you just fix up and make sure, you know, to be able to, to make that work? I just, I don't see how it pencils out. Most of them don't, at least Joe, you could probably, uh, maybe you can chime in there, but I, uh, at least from the stuff I see, it's, it's the cash flowing stuff is few and far between. And, you know, again, you make it on your buy and also the cost of your money. Um, I look at trying to do a lot of creative finance type deals, um, which t the main purpose for that is trying to have lower payments and not having to go and obtain new, new debt. Um, you know, whereas if you're coming in with your own money and then you got to put in 20% down payment, something like that, you, and you cash, you look at the numbers there, um, your return, the, the amount of time it's going to take you, unless it's like a burr where you're doing a rehab on it, the amount of time it's going to take you to actually recoup your down payment funds is forever. Um, so I would, uh, you know, I would say definitely you got to look at the, the cash flow and run your numbers and stuff, but it's, it's all on the buy in, in your funding source. Joe? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's very true. I mean, really, if you're looking for rentals and those type of things, uh, really, I mean, a lot of those, I mean, it's going to be planning off market deals. And that's really um, like being in a group like what Ryan has going on here, um, where people like myself um, and Ryan uh, know about deals that, that are not listed online. Um, you know, those are, those are non-listed deals um, just where a seller for whatever reason they want to sell that property. They have some type of motivating factor where they're going to sell that property. So it's really, um, it's really building relationships with um, people that are really doing this, you know, pretty much on a full-time basis that really have that insight because that's the problem of investing is a, a niche. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of good agents out here um, in our local market here, but um, finding good deals and investing, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a whole different type of animal there because yeah, the prices in the area have jumped considerably, right? Our average price is around 350,000. So yeah, it's, it's very hard to make things cash flow if you're buying them at market value. So um, it really is going to take you a little bit of time for number one for you to understand the market and then number two to find people that you can utilize as a resource who already have those relationships but can actually tee up deals with. Yeah, so like somebody like yourself, so you're an investor, but it sounds like you're also an agent if I understand it right. Um, so how do you do that balance between if you have a client who's an investor too and you work i mean are you selling houses or properties for people who are um, just buying a, a residential for themselves or are you actually helping other investors find properties that they can make a profit on no we 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 do both i mean the thing is there's only so many properties i can buy and so once you have systems set up that you can generate basically leads for for these type of um, sellers that are highly motivated um, then it becomes a system. So you need something that's really a system. Once you have the system, then you can find, you know, which ones are actually really good deals. So uh, we only take on a certain amount of investors that we work with because typically uh, we like to work with people that are a little bit more seasoned because um, most of the deals in this type of market, you have to move very quickly because the competition is very high in this market because we're at a historical low for inventory. So uh, for newer investors, it's a market for them to get into uh, because of these things. Not saying it's impossible, it's just that you have to really educate yourself so you know on your end, you know, when to pull the trigger, you know, because a lot of times what we see with newer investors is they overanalyze. And so they have um, what we call... Um, analysis by uh, paralysis, you know, where they're overanalyzing a deal when this is what we do every day. We know what a good deal is. And, you know, when we tee it up for investors, they're going to make money. on it. Yeah. You look like you, you have another question there, Ash. It looks like you got one. Oh, uh, 
No, I just I was just been reading this book, I don't know, by um Brandon Turner. Never heard of him. Never heard of him. Yeah, I know. He's a pretty popular guy, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, anyways, he actually had a he had a uh a, a webinar the other day I uh, listened to. Anyways, his um he was saying it's like really one in a hundred listings are gonna potentially be a good real estate investment. That was his rule of thumb, you know, and you have to really go through like hundreds of them before you really find the, the right one. And his, his recommendation in the book I'm reading was, if your local market is too expensive, look at maybe investing long distance. And it sounds like you're doing that in Orlando. I'm starting to, I have, I have um, some boots on the ground, some connections in a few different markets. Um, so not in Orlando, I have someone in West Palm, I have someone in like the St. Petersburg, Tampa area. Um, I have, uh, and I have someone in uh, like Cleveland, Ohio. And so I'm looking at how can I leverage that? Because there's certain things about Washington that I don't love. Um, you know, the, the prices are obviously a lot higher here. The cash flow, you know, the cap rates aren't, aren't maybe as attractive if you're looking at cash flow, but you have a lot greater potential for appreciation here, right? Um, but something else, and maybe Joe, if you want to talk about this on, if you want to talk about this on here, uh, feel free, but if not, that's okay too. Um, you know, one thing I don't love about Washington is the, they have pretty intense um, distressed seller laws. Um, and so I was going to ask Joe, if he, if he feels like he wants to maybe go into it, how, how you navigate um, some of the distress stuff with, when you have people, cause you know, you're looking for people that are motivated, well, motivation and distress are somewhat are kind of related, right? Um, and so it seems kind of loose, at least the definition of what is, what does that mean here? And so I don't know if maybe you're probably better educated at this than me. And I'd like to hear your, your take. Yeah. So, um, so it is, it is definitely a fine line. And so, um, you know, we, we usually don't work with people if they're under duress, um, you know, or they need to sell um, a property because uh, being a licensed broker, yeah, there's certain things that we, we have to abide by. So um, it's really understanding, you know, that if somebody is, you know, getting ready to get for, foreclosed on, you know, that's, con that's considered, you know, basically a distressed sale. You know, that's, some, that's not really somebody that we, we're going to be going after. You know, typically the people that we're going after is somebody that owns their house outright cash. And for some reason that's not having to do with foreclosure, they want a quick sale um, because they want to move or they need the money for whatever, um, but not having to deal with those foreclosure, um, those foreclosure laws, uh, because that's what they consider a distress sale. So, so talk to me about this because people that are facing foreclosure does deserve the ability to get out of it or deserve the ability to get help and deserve the ability to maybe not have a foreclosure on their credit. Right. And, you know, because there's a lot of things that are not as harmful to your credit as a foreclosure. Um, yeah. Gosh, even, even filing bankruptcy is not as harmful. So when, walk me through, like, the way that you see that. Because the way I see it, I think it's a bunch of, I, I think it's a bunch of BS, but I'm, that's me. But I, I, I think that if, some, if you have a way to help somebody, then I know why they did it. And I know there were some really, really unscrupulous people, like, you know, maybe yeah. equity skimming, skimming and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, when someone is facing okay, I'm going to lose my house in a month, right? And I'm going to have a foreclosure on my credit. And when they take the house, what are the odds with all the fees and stuff that I'm going to walk away with anything? And someone can come in on their, on their white horse and maybe help them stop a lot of those problems. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, that's, that's tough. And so how, how do those people get help here? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we usually tell them their options, you know, we, we tell them their options about, you know, they could possibly do a forbearance or they could possibly do, do a short sale, you know, on the property. Um, do, you do, that? Do, you, do you see that on your side? Do you, do you actually facilitate the short sales? Um, I used to, I used to facilitate a ton of them um, during the last crash of mm -hmm. 08. Um, so yeah, we did, we did a ton of short sales. So that's kind of something that I have a lot of knowledge in just because I've worked with tons of short sales and also, you know, REOs. So, um, so we, we try to help them if we can we can we can help them but we at the same time we we, we abide by you know whatever the, the laws are but um you know a lot of times they have to they have to want that help 
because that's one thing once you deal with dealt in the distressed market not everybody uh wants that is motivated you cut out actually again actually follow your guidance so um can you hear me now yeah there's a lot of denial yeah. for sure in, in the in the pre-foreclosure the, the people that are behind on payments there's a ton of denial and like oh i'm gonna i've got it taken care of i'm gonna get it there and so then getting past that and finding the people to help that maybe could use it. But again, in Washington, I avoid it on that side of things, but I would love to not be able, like, that's just like, it just seems like that's just a natural fit for like looking for people to help. Right. Yeah. But, um, but you know, and I just watched a, actually I just, the last two days I watched um, a training thing on uh, short sales um, just because my prediction, and of course, you know, I have different look, outlooks and my own opinion and stuff, but I, I think in the I think in the next six months they're going to have a huge comeback. You know, I, I see just the fallout of this long-term uh, COVID stuff. There's a ton of shortage in inventory, but there's also you know people's incomes have changed, people's livelihoods have changed, lots of jobs that maybe don't exist anymore that used to. And I think you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of people that deferred maybe that can't get caught up, and maybe their bank isn't going to play with them the way they want to play. And uh, you know, so I think short sales are are gonna are gonna be back and loan mods and that kind of thing. But that's just me on my soapbox. Yeah, right now, last time that I that I looked, um, that I looked about 4.7 million um, homeowners um, were in forbearance. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's so that's a lot. That's a lot of homes. Obviously, not all of those people are are, are going to, you know, lose their homes. But yes, there's there's going to be fallout from this. Um, what what people have to understand is because they're like, oh, you know. We, we haven't seen anything that's because this is going to take some time because you have to understand you know unemployment benefits if i remember correctly last 39 weeks so they used to, they, it used to be six months basically and then they extended it well i guess 13 weeks would be would be the 39 weeks then wouldn't it i think it was 13 weeks they added it okay yeah, they added 13 weeks yep yeah. so um so if you if you just kind of i i kind of looked at exactly when, when those benefits end for most people. And um, that's we won. So that means realistically, um, second, second and third quarter of 2021, you're going to see the, you're going to start to see the effects of what's happened uh, because of COVID-19 then. Yeah, I think, I think there was a, there was a Ken McElroy video recently um, where he was talking about how basically look at like 2020 as a wash, 2021 try to stack paper, and 2022 it's like time to buy, right? And like that's just, you know, he's a super smart dude. No, who knows right, wrong, whatever, but I know he's been right a lot and he's a pretty smart dude. So um, something to kind of consider. Which is, when you say stack paper, is that what do you mean by that? Get, get your money ready to deploy. Like so if you can put as much as you can ready to go so that you can um, – so that you can you can be be an active buyer. Someone who can, like like Joe was talking about, like he only likes you know wants to work with investors that can pull the trigger quickly, right? And so that's getting ready to deploy your cash and, and get active. Like in this market, what would you say is what somebody needs as far as capital available to to be a successful investor? You know, not trying to hit a home run or anything, but. I think it, I think the answer is the lawyer or accountant question that like, it depends, right? It depends. I know it depends. I know. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you can just do some rough math, right? I mean, if you, if you're going to buy an investment property, you're going to need to put 20% down. So, you know, roughly, you know, on a $300,000 property, that's 60, $60,000 right there. Well, right? so I was, um, some funding sources, if you're going like hard money, like traditional purchase, I think you can get as low as 15 ish. Um, you know, it just because they'll base it on ARV and they'll look at your repairs and all that kind of stuff. If you're looking at like a flip type acquisition, um, you know, I try to look at some more creative ways of acquiring stuff, but um, you know, but there's a lot of a lot of uh education and a lot of stuff that goes into it with the seller to try to pull it off, but. Um, you know, the traditional side, I would say probably 15-ish, Joe, unless you have a private lender that's willing to, to work with you. If you obviously get a funding source that's like a friend, doctor with a self-directed 401k or IRA or something, like that would be an awesome way to do it too. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we have some private lenders that, that lend us money. Um, 
So, I mean, yeah, that's just basically you finding somebody that's not making a good yield on their money or, you know, they're probably only seeing two or three to 3% and you, you can negotiate with them the eight or 9%. Um, but if you're just going the traditional route, again, conventional loan, um, you might be able to find a lender that can do 15, but rule of thumb is most of them are going to um, want 20% down and many of your closing costs. So realistically, I would say for, for an investment property, you're going to need probably around 60 to $75,000 uh, to get into that property. Now that's, is that assuming that it's in great shape? I mean, I would, just, I would imagine there's going to be rehab costs and there's going to be all these other carrying costs. Associated. Yeah. So, so that's, that's assuming that it's basically turnkey. So that's just you buying something on market that the numbers pencil out. Um, that's, that's not anything that's off market that, you know, you need to do some rehab to. All right. Well, thank you. That's helpful. I know I am. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're. It, and so it's that's why it's so tough. And obviously, you were you were expressing your frustration earlier too with buying something that's on the market that's that's retail ready and then making it cash flow. And here it's it's just tough to make it pencil. And then you're, even if it, even if your cash flow is positive, you know you're you're twenty percent down on a four hundred thousand dollar house is eighty grand. What's your what's your break even point? When do you get that money back? When you're making a hundred bucks a month. You know, yeah. so well, I know I'm not. I mean, that's the thing. I'm not even looking to buy like a, you know, a listed house. I mean, they just seem to be um, too expensive and they're none of them. There are very few. Now, admittedly, I haven't done a whole lot of like scouring of the uh, different um, search engines for houses, but it just doesn't seem in this area, at least that many um, rehab potential houses. It seems a lot of the ones that are on the market that I've seen again, Pretty limited sample. Um, it just aren't that um, there aren't that many opportunities for sort of the burr or the, or the uh, rehab or any of those kind of well, Ash, appreciation. I would tell you this, Ash. You uh, are talking to a couple of people that come across deals off market. That perhaps if you talk to us later, we might be able to help you or find something at some point. And you know, there's other sources too. You can get on wholesaler lists and that kind of thing and have them send deals. I don't know your I don't know your financials to know your availability of funds or you know uh, your ability to get the financing or whatever. But I'm assuming you know if you could if you're looking for investments, um, there's there's definitely some ways to look at off market discount properties and flips, just not on the MLS usually. Yeah, I just I mean because it's it seems like those are all the nice houses. <laughs> and well, when we actually have our normal happy hour meetup, it'd be a great time to come over and have a beer and. Uh, and we can even discuss that stuff then, or you can just message me offline or online. Okay. Oh, not in the Zoom call. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, any, anything, uh, do you have anything else, Joe? No, um, I, think, I think really as far as our real estate market, you know, for these, for these next probably four months, it's gonna be very, very intense. Uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of pent up demand from people uh, delaying their buying or selling options. But uh, no, I think uh, if people play it right, they might see some opportunities um, later in 2022 um, and 2021. So, um, but that's the other part was um, typically when, when the deals do come around, most people are too fearful to buy. That's just something that we see that we call herd mentality. So everybody, everybody wants to sell when everybody else is selling and everybody wants to buy when everybody else is buying. But that's the thing is you, you need to buy in the dips, which um, it, it takes more certainty and you really have to know what you're doing because uh, even during this COVID thing, we, we picked up some properties um, where other investors, you know, they weren't doing anything because they were scared, but we were pretty certain of, what the market was to do, so we continued to to make those acquisitions. So, uh, really understanding the market, really knowing what's what's uh, kind of coming down the pike, or working with somebody that does not know that's going to uh, be half the battle. That wasn't you that bought the one out from under me today, was it? <laughs> no. That's good. No. no. Good. I want I want to do that to you. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I even I even asked the guy because I just assumed he told him where my where my numbers came in, and then because it was just magically like five grand more. Yeah. And so I was just like, did you tell him, did you tell him that you had my offer and what it was? He's like, no. I'm like, okay, fine. I'm like, dang it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, that type of stuff happens to us all the time, man. So yeah. it's just, it's just part of the business. I just assume my, my, my people skills will help me and then they'll like me so much that maybe they won't even talk to other people. <laughs> you know, most, most people like the money more, man. You know. Ah, damn it. Right. Well, cool. And then, uh, Joe, any, any final, final things? We can, I know you got to go at five, so you're, you're good. Um, well, not, not really. I mean, I think, uh, I think you got a good little group going here. So I would just tell people to use you as a resource, man. And anybody that wants to know about EXP, use you as a resource for that, you know, but, uh, no, I'm excited to actually come to one of your, uh, investment meetups once, uh, we're able to meet in person. I know. Well, I know I'm very curious about the lagging uh, comfortableness of that, even when it does open up. Because like some people like my wife, that you know, she's she has some respiratory things, and she just has like an anxiety now about like you know, she went into a grocery store for the first time, and she's like, doo, 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 doo. and like how many people are are in kind of a similar boat, right? So like when you actually have like these these gatherings, um, you know, how many people are actually even going to show up? Because now now the, the the online stuff just becomes so common, right? Yeah. Um, well, with the with the weather being nicer outside, I mean, it gives you more options. You know what I'm saying? Where uh, we're not confined to an inside space, where you can do do it somewhere where you know we're we're, we're outside outdoors and stuff. That's true. I did I did get a golf once. So. <laughs> so, so I have a question, Ryan. With these meetups, are you are you planning on doing this every week, or what's your? Well, this one, this thing uh, is like a monthly deal. Um, we we were meeting up at a, uh, there's a, there's a tap house up on Tumwater Hill, um, called hops on the hill. And that's where, where we'd meet in about once a month. And then, um, you know, and so then we started, well, with all this stuff kind of happening, I tried, I'm trying to get some of the people still to connect on, on the, the zoom calls and that kind of thing. Um, we even have, a, a small accountability group, like on Monday mornings where we're connecting on that. Some of us, um, you know, so what is what is the accountability group? I I saw those notices. Oh yeah, that and that's um, that you know we we keep the we keep that at a maximum of five, uh, but what we do with it is more like so someone like me, I need to keep those constant the constant reminders of the goals I need to do for the week, how many you know sellers I'm, I need to talk to, how many offers I plan on trying to make. Um, you know, other major goals, like for example, dealing with something on one of my websites or, uh, you know, my, my KV core follow up or, you know, um, you know, things like that, that are metrics that I need to be, I, I know are there, but it's so easy for all of us that, you know, the days just get away from us. We get distracted with kids or family life. And, and then you, you just pissed away another week and you didn't get to the stuff that you planned on doing. Um, and so the accountability and then, you know, holding, holding each other accountable and, and declaring our goals and what we're planning on doing. And um, that's, that's kind of the thought behind it. If you, you like Brandon Turner, the kind of premise behind it, I was, I got into the, uh, I did the intention journal thing and then got paired with a mastermind group on that. And I, th three of us stayed together and are still friends and stuff, but we, we kept the group going for like a year. Um, and uh, you know, all doing different things. And one guy's got a bunch of storage units. The other guy's done a bunch of tiny houses and has some other stuff going on. And, um, and there's little old me, but like, you know, kind of uh, just the, just that accountability and that, you know, like-minded people getting together is powerful sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, awesome guys. Yeah. What, you got one more, bud? You got one, you got another one, Ash? No, no, that's great. I mean, um, I mean, my wife is the one who was really trying to dragging me um, into the, the real estate investing world. I know, but the more I learn about it, the more interesting it's becoming for me, or less exotic anyways. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad to have an opportunity to hear what you guys are saying and learning a lot from you guys. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll try to, you know, tune in again next month and, um, and keep learning, I guess, you know, at this point, I, like I said, I, um, I feel like I'm very much of a learning phase. I know I'm the analysis paralysis. I don't want to get caught in that too much. Um, but it sounds like in the next year or two, there's going to be a lot of opportunities. I mean, 
there's there's always right. opportunities in every there's market. always opportunities but a yeah, lot wait, more me, tell you what i'm going to stop the recording and then if you want to chat a little more i know joe you got to go um yeah but then let me stop